Okay, and uh, so thanks, Troy. And we're now going to move to the uh, uh, second theory talk by uh, Rachel Crespo Atero. So, uh, Rachel, could you please share your screen? Yes, sure. Um, Thank you. Rachel is from uh, uh, Queen Mary University, uh, London, and uh, she's going to talk about the modeling of aggregation induced emission in molecular crystals. And I suspect that conical intersections are going to appear again in this presentation. So, the stage is yours. Good, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to send the organizing committee because uh, I really enjoyed this uh, workshop so far. So um, today I'll be, I'll be talking about some of the work that we've been doing about uh, modeling aggregation induced emission in organic molecular crystals. Our motivation uh, is mainly um, because of the applications that we can find for highly emissive organic crystals. And here we are focusing mainly on systems that are metal free because they are cheaper and we found them uh, like more interesting, let's say. So uh, if we think of different applications like organic lasers, bi uh, uh, bioproof and um, OLEDs, we can find that uh, we can find some organic molecules that can be, uh, be uh, working for these applications. So. Um, our problem here and the main challenge that we have when we move, when we move from a dilute solution for a flexible organic molecule to the solid state is like because of the presence of some stable aggregates or some charge transfer states, we will have quenching of emission uh, in concentrate solution and also when we go to the solid state. So if uh, our aim is to maximize the uh, um, quantum efficiency, we will be looking at either increasing the radiative decay in the condensed phase or decreasing the non-radiative decay. We will see that in general, because of the level of localization of the excitation in this kind of systems, we will make mainly focusing on how to find ways of decreasing no radiative decay. So if we just think about the Fermi golden rule and we think about the different contributions to no radiative decay, we can see that we have a clearly a nuclear contribution here that is related to the overlap between the vibrational electronic wave functions of the excited and the ground state. And we also have like important contribution from the noradiabatic couplings or uh, electron phonon, phonon couplings here that comes from the uh, coupling between the nuclei, the nuclei and the electronic states. So when we think about uh, these terms, we have to take a look at regions of a high uh, noradiabatic couplings. And this normally happens when you are close to a conical intersection. Uh, there are uh, uh, structures where you have that uh, with a conical structure where you have the same energy uh, for the excited, uh, uh, the first, uh, the excited and the ground state, and it has a, a conical shape. So uh, there are two models that have been mainly used to look at what happens when we look at a, a systems with aggregation induced emission. And these systems are systems where when you move to the solid state, you find that aggregation quenching is a switch off. So you have an increase of emission in the solid state. And essentially we've been looking at uh, how for some typical systems we can uh, obtain this kind of behavior. Uh, the models that have been uh, used to explain this are two main models. One is that the restriction of intramolecular motion or rotation that is mainly looking at reducing the overlap between the nuclear wave functions. And uh, the other model that's been mainly developed by uh, Blanca 4 is related to uh, the uh, restricted access to the conical intersection. Essentially, if we want to minimize the non radiative decay through a uh, conical intersections, you need, you, we need to make uh, the energy of these conical intersections higher where, when they are in the, in, the, in the solid state, so you won't be able to decay through this kind of pathways. Uh, what we've been looking, uh, looking at is at a different set of crystals with a uh, similar uh, uh, electronic structures uh, with different crystal packing and showing uh, in some cases, solid state luminescent enhancement, enhancement, that is the name that is also used to talk about aggregation induced emission in the solid state. And uh, with 
we compare this kind of system with similar systems where you don't have the enhancement. So looking at that and looking at the crystal packing and the different uh, possible mechanisms that you can have uh, driving no radiative decay, we try to understand how uh, aggregation induced emission could work in the in the solid state. So um, let's think a bit about possible aggregation effects that we can have in the uh, condensed phase. And the first thing that comes to our mind is that think about the exciton model and think, uh, think about the possibility of increasing uh, radiative decay because of the formation of gay aggregates. So uh, we could think like when you have a, a crystal with a uh, a large number of J aggregates, you could in principle increase the uh, radiative decay because you increase like the uh, oscillator strains uh, twice. But this is not that simple because as you already know, this model is really uh, 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 basic to say. I mean, it's based on the Columbic interactions mainly. And we need to consider all our possibilities and we can we need to consider the effect of the electrostatic interactions with the, with the environment and so on. So uh, if we think about uh, uh, dimers with the uh, that can be uh, represented by the Spanos model of any other model related to exciton uh, couplings, we can see that the description is not that as easy as using like the age of J aggregate description. But in general, you will see that just based on uh, the formation of certain kind of aggregates, you cannot explain the uh, enhanced emission in this kind of crystals. So. Um, we will be looking at, in most cases, to systems with small exciton couplings uh, in comparison, of course, with re reorganization energies. And we'll try to, in a way, uh, reduce the interactions between the molecules. The reason for that, one of the reasons for that, is to reduce non-radiative decay. And thinking about the possible effects that we can have in aggregates uh, due to non-radiative no decay. And I'm, I'm, adding, I'm adding this uh, uh, slide here because it's in a way related with what Sergey showed before about the formation of possible intermolecular conical intersections. And uh, this, the reason is like if you have a system where you can establish a short transfer state and can couple the short transfer state with some particular vibration, you could be able to find conical intersections, intermolecular conical intersections that can drive the photochemistry of the system to the ground state. And we want to avoid this kind of processes because these kind of processes are going to switch off emission. So just looking at this case, and this is a case of a, a dimer of m methyl formamide a system where we have intermolecular proton transfer. If we excite the system, we, excite, we start exciting the system to a local excited state. And you can see that after some time, we have some crossing to a chart transfer state. Uh, after the electro uh, uh, electronic density moved to the other molecule, you could see that there was a motion of the proton here that was coupled to that uh, uh, excited state. And you could see that this uh, state here drive the dynamics of the system and took the system to the ground state. So we want to avoid this kind of processes. And we can do that by controlling the crystal packing in a way that you can clearly localize the excited states in the system. So uh, we look at the set of crystals showing solid state luminous enhancement or aggregation induced emission in the solid state. And uh, we can see the kind of systems that we have. This is a set of 13 crystals. Uh, all of them are flexible molecules. And uh, the packing uh, uh, structures that you could find uh, are mainly like herringbone and shit uh, um, uh, package. So if we look at the exciton couplings here, the exciton couplings are in the normal rank of, of normal organic semiconductor systems where we are between zero and 150 uh, mega electron volts. And you can see that the reorganization energies are really high. I mean, if you compare the reorganization energy with the excitation couplings, you can see that we have a clear trend to a uh, localize the excitation on single molecules. So uh, let's look at what happens with the possible conical intersections that we can have for these systems when we are in solution and, we, uh, and the conicals that are, of course, restricted if you have like the aggregation induced emission in the solid. And we can see if we look at that, some typical conicals are associated with rain pokering, are just uh, related to the uh, change of the uh, some of the aromatic strings of the systems, they are clearly uh, uh, 
avoided when you are in the solid, they are very high in energy. And uh, other possibilities that we have is like um, intramolecular rotation, for example, for this system. And in this case, this intramolecular rotation is also a coupled with intramolecular proton, in, uh, intramolecular proton transfer. You can see really here that uh, we have like a, a accessible conical intersection when we, you are in vacuum or when you are in solution as well. And this uh, uh, conical intersections is uh, higher in energy and not accessible when we are in the, when we are in the solid. So uh, essentially, uh, if we want to optimize this kind of systems, what we are looking at, we are trying then to have systems when we, you can clearly localize the excitations where we have like a small exciton couplings in comparison with the reorganization energies and where you avoid the uh, presence or a stable of a stable conical intersections. Uh, so let's talk a bit about how to model this kind of systems. And then I'm going to show you a couple of examples of particular systems that we uh, analyze and we try to compare, trying to find some general rules here. And again, we need, uh, if we are going to describe this kind of systems, we need to uh, uh, decide whether to use like a localized uh, electronic structure term technique or moving to periodic boundary condition methods. Uh, because of the clearly localized uh, nature of the excitations here, our favorite method is to use uh, embedding technique. But to keep the description of the, the long range interactions with the crystal, uh, we uh, use uh, evil embedding techniques. Essentially, uh, this kind of uh, uh, methods uh, allow us for describing the fed on of the long, long range interactions with the uh, crystal. Uh, keeping the description of the system using a cluster. So essentially we start the calculation, but uh, using a periodic boundary condition method, modeling the whole crystal there. And then we extract a, extract a cluster from this crystal. We uh, select then three regions and uh, in the central region, we will localize the, is where we have the ex, uh, localized excitation. We, uh, we define a second region here uh, where uh, we keep the charges of that region uh, fixed to use as a, to uh, add as a buffer and not allow, allowing for a charge leaking, for example. And then we uh, select a third region here where uh, we change the charges of the cell region to reproduce the eval charges that we get uh, in this central region. As you know, the eval method uh, is used to calculate long range uh, uh, columbic interactions and columbic interactions in general when we are to, uh, working with periodic system, uh, uh, systems. So essentially what we do is to try to fit a set of charges to make sure that we in a way keep the periodic description of the of the whole system. So we have implemented this technique and we also uh, added uh, some extra calculation using a cluster model in a way that uh, we can consider also other kind of interactions that dispersion and uh, other uh, not uh, columbic interactions, at least uh, at the level of the ground state. So defining the energy using these cluster models, we are able to define total energies, gradients, and other properties. And we can use that to optimize uh, not also minima, but also uh, conical intersections in the solid state. So using this method, uh, we've been able to study different systems. And I wanted to tell you that uh, that method, uh, method and all our tools were implemented mainly by a, a, a PhD student in my group, uh, Miguel Rivera. He's uh, currently working at, at UCL. Um, he uh, implemented a set of methods based on this uh, electrostatic embedding technique, and uh, you can uh, you can see that we can uh, use different electronic structure uh, 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 programs here: Gaussian turbo mol, mol gas DFTV, uh, Cypher. We are developing now interface for Cypher as well, and uh, we have a choice of different methods we can do to the DFT ADC2. We have also multi-configurational techniques that are very important if we want to describe crossings between the excited and the ground state. So uh, between the tools that have been implemented, we also have different tools to calculate exciton uh, couplings, to do some uh, automatic exciton classification, and also to do some different kind of automatic uh, uh, things that you need to do when you are going to study a localized excitation in a cluster. So I recommend you to look at the at the program at the program maybe you can find it interesting so um let's talk 
uh, about some specific cases, and uh, I want I want to talk in particular about uh, the case of a set of, set of crystals that show aggregation-induced emission, and they are uh, uh, they show intramol intramolecular proton transfer in the in the excited state. So. Uh, this kind of systems are interesting because essentially we can modulate the emission from the uh, keto or the inner regime depending on the media. And this kind of systems, they have a donor acceptor structure, so you can regulate uh, their properties uh, uh, by uh, tuning the the, uh, the 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 environment. So uh, the kind of systems that I'm going to talk, uh, to show you, uh, these systems has has shown prom promising um, uh, properties to be used uh, as organic lasers using a, a optical pumping. So uh, they they are mainly for fluores uh, fluorescence uh, uh, molecules. So what we have for this kind of systems, we have like they don't show emission emission in solution and they they most of them show aggregation induced emission when you move to the solid state. Uh, so uh, we have like by slightly changing the structure of the system, we can really modulate the uh, quantum yield. And this is experimental data. Uh, we have looked at the crystal structure of most of the systems, but I'm going to mainly focus on these three systems that show like the extreme behavior. Uh, if we look at, at, at uh, HC1, uh, uh, it has this uh, structure here, uh, just hydrogens uh, for R1 and R2. And you can see that if you add a, a metoxy group uh, in this position, you move from having like highly emissive response in the solid to have very a, a little uh, emission. Uh, and we also look at this kind of systems where by removing a, a, an aromatic a group, you can see that you can significantly increase the uh, quantum yield of the system. So essentially, we try to look at this system and try to explain the differences between them, why the system doesn't emit, why uh, when this one does it, and why this system here shows a more uh, efficient emission than the other two. So uh, before doing anything, we took a look at the crystal structures and tried to analyze for all the crystal where there were some uh, packing motif that were the, the responsible for the difference in, in the system. And in general, we found that uh, some systems that emit and have a similar structures to the one that emit. So it's not, there is not a clear explanation just based on the analysis of the crystal structures. So if we look at the uh, potential energy surfaces and the mechanisms associated with the no radiative, uh, no radiative decay of the systems, we can see like depending on whether you have or not uh, excited state proton transfer, we can stabilize two S1 minima. So we, we will have two minima in the excited state. One is uh, associated with the reorganization that happens in the structure just for going to the excited states. And I, I'm going to call this the inner regime. And this inner regime will have, uh, it has a reorganization energy that is different to the one in the keto regime, that uh, the one in the keto regime is just uh, related to how the system reorganizes because the proton was transferred to the other side of the molecule. And uh, you will find like the, for this system, the reorganization because of proton transfer is going to be, of course, it's going to give you uh, is going to be more uh, uh, stable. You have this organization and it is larger than this one. If we look at the uh, at the differences between different substituents, you could see that in the case of HC5, the system that doesn't show emission in the solid state, the excited state proton transfer there is extremely efficient. So we try to look at that and try to analyze the possible mechanisms that we had here. Uh, these are the results of not adiabatic uh, uh, dynamics of surface hopping done for the two string cases, done for a uh, one and five. And you can see that in the case of one, that is the system where we have like more um, uh, efficient emission 
uh, for the series HC, you will see that there is a distribution of the uh, excited state trajectories between the enol and the keto regime. So uh, is, there is almost a, an equal amount of molecules that will deactivate through the keto and through the enol regime. And both, uh, um, and both mechanisms are associated to conical intersections. And in solution, both of them are accessible. Uh, we can see that in the case of five, the system that uh, doesn't show emission in the solid is mainly everything going to the excited state proton transfer mechanisms, so to the uh, keto uh, regime. So uh, the next thing that we, we did was to analyze the same processes in the solid. And before moving to the results, I would like to show you uh, the effect of considering the uh, eval embedding cluster in the energies that you get for this kind of systems. And you can see that um, in the case of the uh, adsorption energies, we don't gain too much by considering the uh, uh, long range interactions with the, with the crystal. But if we want to reproduce the fluorescence wavelet, we really need to take a look at what happens with these long range interactions. Yes, that is just to show you that in some cases, it could be important to take into account uh, what happens with the uh, long range uh, electrostatic interactions. So, um, if we try to uh, check uh, whether the reason for the differences between these systems is uh, not the non-radiative pathway, by the radiative pathway, we try to calculate the rates. And you can see here that clearly, uh, if we compare the radiative uh, 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 rates, you will see that they are very similar for the three systems. So the main difference between them is related to non-radiative decay. So it's important to really look at what happens uh, with the mechanism in the solid. If we uh, optimize the conical intersections for the system in the solid, you will find that uh, one of the conical intersections that wasn't the most stable uh, in, the, in, the, in the gas phase is going to be more stable when we go to the solid. And this uh, conical intersection is associated mainly with the pockering of the carbon uh, that is related to the uh, oxygen that, uh, that is involved in the proton transfer uh, uh, mechanism. If we try to find a similar conical intersection for the inner regime in the solid, this a, a channel is completely blocked in the solid. So one of the effects that we have when we move uh, from a gas phase to the solid is like you block the conical intersection associated with the enol form. But still, you can find low energy conical intersections or relatively low energy conical intersections associated with the uh, keto channel. I mean, associated with the proton transfer channel. So if we compare the systems that uh, show uh, aggregation induced emission and don't show aggregation induced emission in the solid, you can see that clearly in the case of the one that doesn't show a, a emission in the solid of is not that bright the emission, you can see that the conical intersection, even when it's related to a small uh, a barrier here, is accessible, what in the case of the other system is not accessible. We've tested this with the different uh, uh, QM regions using one molecule, two molecules, four molecules, and we get always the same kind of description. So it's not something that is related with the model, but it's a, a really, it's really a, a part of the, of the uh, explanation of why these systems behave differently. The reason for the uh, difference between these two systems is essentially uh, the short range electrostatic interactions that we have. And uh, if we try to move to the case of HP that I've seen at the beginning is the most efficient system in this, uh, it had like quantum efficiency higher than um, 0 0.7, you can see that this conical intersection in the solid is not uh, uh, accessible either. So we can explain using this model why um, uh, HP and HC are, are highly emissive, but uh, and why HC5 is, uh, is not emissive. But why, why is the reason for the different behavior between HC1 and HC5? Why uh, we have that um, uh, HP1 uh, shows like 
a more, more efficient emission in the solid. And the reason for that is again related to the competition between the localization and the, the localization of the excitation. If we look at the uh, reorganization energies that we get for the two regimes, we can see, as I mentioned at the beginning, that the uh, reorganization energies associated with the keto uh, regime as are much, lar much larger than the ones related to the inner regime. In the case of the systems HC5, and HP, uh, you, don't re, uh, you don't obtain a, a stable uh, enol structure in the solid state. And this is because the proton transfer structure, because of the electronic electro structure of the system, is significantly more stable. Well, in the case of HC1, uh, you will see that uh, even when the reorganization energies are smaller, you have some uh, uh, stabilization of the enol regime. And when we compare, the rates of the uh, uh, of the processes, we can see that we can have some transport pro, uh, processes related to the enol, enol forms that can be populated for HC1 that can explain why we have some loss of a quantum yield when we are talking uh, about this kind of system. So using the smalls, we think we can explain what are the differences between them and um, uh, I, I have a, a last example to show you. I'm going to uh, explain explain it very bri briefly. Uh, Liliana, uh, who was working with, in my group for, for a couple of years and now is working with Johan, uh, uh, showed the results that we obtained for the systems. And you can see them uh, in poster 24, uh, 23. And just going to explain this very quickly. And uh, I would like to talk about it because it's also related with the participation of triple states and the possibility that we have of having like a, a single triple a, a crossing geometries that can also drive the photochemistry of this kind of systems or can a, affect the photochemistry in the solid state. And uh, here we just wanted to explain the differences in behavior of these three kind of systems. You can see that changing the nature of the this atom here, silicon, this is a an example of very efficient uh, aggregation in this emission. And if we move from silicon to carbon, we still have very strong aggregation in this emission. If we move to uh, sulfur, aggregation in this emission is uh, very weak. Again, we have clear localization of the excited states in one molecule here with significant reorganization energies that are in, in the end related to the rotation around these dihedral bonds. So, uh, if we look at the potential energy surfaces of the system that show aggregation induced emission, and it's similar to the case of silicon, essentially the excited state uh, 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 pathways are related to pokering here. We will decay through pokering conical intersection here. Uh, that is clearly a, a uh, it, it cannot be accessed when you are in the crystal. So uh, what happens when we, have, we, when we have sulfur? When we have sulfur, in addition to the uh, not, not radiative pathway that is associated to the conical intersections that I showed you before. And in this case, there is a, some, a, a difference because the uh, pathway that you have here, instead of being associated with pokering, is associated with a, a, a carbon sulfur bone breaking. And this conical is accessible when we are in, in, in vacuum, while uh, we have also uh, another a, a structure that takes the system to the to the uh, ground state that is related to the crossing between the sin the the triple state and the single state. When we move to when we move to the crystal, uh, the crossing related to the uh, uh, triples uh, doesn't change its energy so much and is uh, still accessible. While the crossing that is related, uh, the conical intersection that is related to the crossing between the single states increases its energy. And uh, if we look at the potential energy surfaces that we have here, and this is the case of the, of the crystal, and we calculate uh, the spin orbit couplings around the uh, carbon sulfur. Uh, uh, a reaction coordinate, we can say, we can see that because of the change of nature of the states uh, that we have here, 
uh, we will have significant spin orbit coupling uh, along uh, the reaction coordinate that uh, you can see that uh, is going to increase uh, one, uh, once we have uh, intermolecular distances larger than 2.4. So this- Excuse uh, me, Rachel, could you please conclude in the interest of time? I'm sorry. Yes, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to finish now. So uh, essentially, uh, this is the message that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, um, tell you. Essentially, uh, we think that these models are very helpful to explain uh, the behavior of this kind of systems where you can have a, a, an enhancement of emission when we move to the solid state. Uh, we are currently working a lot with triples. Uh, Federico showed uh, indeed a poster where we were working with uh, uh, the case of Carbasol and that, and that we can uh, you can take a look at, at this poster. And uh, I would like to uh, send the sense the member of my group, in particular uh, Miguel, uh, Michael, and, and Liliana, who uh, contributed to all the projects that I showed today, also to all other members of my group, uh, just send uh, to the uh, funding agencies also on and uh, to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I uh, took uh, uh, more time than expected. Thank you very much, Rachel, for the really interesting talk. Um, now, I'm afraid that we do not have time to take questions right now, so I would refer you to the chat. But in fact, I think that there is no immediate question in the chat. So anyway, the various discussion channels are, of course, open. There are many details that are interesting. And so thanks again for the presentation and uh, we will have a slightly shortened, unfortunately, coffee break, um, just 10 minutes, and we will continue at 4.15 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. So